Okay, so let's get into the subject of today. My guest is a man named John Rappaport. He's a really super duper special guest. He's got some really valuable information to share. You've probably heard, or you might have heard, uh, John Rappaport on various other media platforms. He's done Coast to Coast AM. He's been on TV, print, everywhere. And he's an investigative journalist. I'll tell you more about him in a moment. But he is coming on the show to talk to us about the very specific uh, threat that we're being told is like this crisis level epidemic borderline uh and, and of course, what I'm talking about is Zika, the Zika virus. Uh, and then more broadly, we're going to talk about the Centers for Disease Control. We're going to talk about government corruption as it relates to the pharmaceutical industry and vaccines and all of this. And this is a subject very close to my heart. Those of you who have been following the show, you kind of know what my vibe is when it comes to big pharma and vaccinations and the ingredients that are in involved in included in vaccines, especially um, compulsory vaccination, especially when it comes to children and babies. Um, so we're going to be touching on a little bit of all of that in today's show, but most specifically surrounding the Zika virus. And as I was thinking about this today, it reminded me of this movie that came out like back in 2011 and it's so relevant to the discussion it it's a movie called Contagion it was a groundbreaking ceremony for a new factory did she mention seeing anyone who was sick anyone on a plane at the airport no she said she was jet lagged <laughs> The average person touches their face three to five times every waking minute. In between, we're touching doorknobs, water fountains, and each other. I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. It's a film that's directed by Steven Soderbergh. Big stars in it. Matt Damon, Kate Winslet, Jude Law, Lawrence Fishburne. It's a film with a very familiar premise. And I've talked before about, for some reason, I just love movies about ep epidemics and like weird doomsday uh, outbreak scenarios. I don't know why. I just kind of am fascinated by them. Um, but this film is kind of that familiar premise that we've seen time and time again, even going back to like the Andromeda strain. Um, strange new virus enters the public domain. The bug spreads rapidly. It's pretty much deadly. It spins beyond the control of anyone who's trying to treat it. And before we know it, millions of people are dead. Millions of people are infected. Pandemonium ensues. Really textbook doomsday infection material. <clears throat> so what stands out about this film, Contagion, is that it has a very clear agenda. And it kind of sneaks up on you as the film uh, progresses. The uh, Jude Law, he plays a man named Alan Crumweed. He's an internet blogger slash conspiracy theorist, and he's attempting to expose the corruption surrounding the search for a cure for this killer virus that is, you know, infecting millions of people in the movie. People are just dropping like flies. So, <clears throat> He kind of appears to be like this intrepid hero, and he discovers a natural remedy for the virus, just a, a like an herbal remedy, and he uses himself as a guinea pig to see if this works. Um, he gets himself infected with the virus, and then he vlogs himself administering the herbal cure, the herbal remedy, and he proves that it works because he doesn't die from the illness. So after seeing this, the public just kind of bombards any shop that might be carrying this stuff, hoping to get this drug so that they can cure themselves and their friends and their family. And meanwhile, Alan Crumweed continues to hold the feet of the CDC to the fire, and he's accusing them of covering up the cure and allowing millions of do people to die for a profit. So as the film goes on, you kind of transition back to members of the CDC who are continuing to search for a vaccine. They're desperately looking for a vaccine. Their own members are getting infected and dying. So there's one scientist who who has the 
uh, the virus and she tests this potential vaccine on herself. So what happens is she tries the vaccine and she gets better. So they found the cure. And so it's announced the entire world is inoculated with this vaccine against what could have been like an extinction level event. The CDC saves the day with their vaccine. Meanwhile, and this is where it gets really creepy. So Mr. Crumweed, Alan Crumweed, he's exposed as not being such a hero after all. Remember, he's the conspiracy theorist. He turns out he was never actually infected with the disease. He fabricated the efficacy of the herbal remedy. And now he's like encouraging people not to take it, not to take the vaccine. He's like telling people don't take the vaccine. And because of this, he's accused of jeopardizing people's lives. And, you know, millions of his followers visit his site daily. And, and they're, he's being accused of just leading all of these people astray. And he's laughing all the way to the bank. Ha ha ha. Thank goodness, of course, in the film, for the government. They only have our best interests and well-being in mind. Otherwise, we could all succumb to the wiles of those sinister bloggers and devious conspiracy theorists who will only cause us pain and heartache. So while I was watching this film, my mind kind of kept wondering back. And see, now remember, this film came out in like 2010, 2011. So it was right after the big H1N1 or swine, swine flu scare. Um, the swine flu, of course, was supposed to be the pandemic that brought the world to its knees. And vaccinations were handed out. And But there was like this undercurrent of skepticism that started to boil online. People were talking about it. What's in the vaccine? You know, what what happens if I refuse the vaccine? What Will it become mandatory? Will they quarantine me and force me to take it? Like people were asking these really legit questions and it created like this public relations nightmare. And our guest, uh, John Rappaport, actually is going to touch a bit on the swine flu thing uh, in our upcoming interview. But of course, the H1N1 scare turned out to be a bust and it was just embarrassing for the CDC. But people were talking, and maybe for the first time, people en masse were talking about this kind of creepiness about this this vaccine that comes out of nowhere that everyone's supposed to take. So Contagion used these fears and these skeptical inquiries against the viewer, and they offered a scenario where believing anything other than the official government stance on the outbreak could get you killed. So they present the person who questions the government as the villain. And it's really brilliant because it painted this picture that to question the CDC or to question the government at large would be this huge mistake and it's super irrational and it could get you dead. The most frightening thing about contagion is this implication that such a scenario is right around the corner. It's always looming and it's super random. The circumstances leading to the creation of such a killer virus could be something as random as, as they say in the film, the wrong pig encounters the wrong bat. Literally just some random freak nature thing happens and we're all going to die. That's how it's presented. It could happen any minute. It could happen right now. Also, kind of as a side note of what I discovered about the film, sort of just this programming aspect of it, is that the people at the CDC were portrayed by really beautiful people like Kate Winslet, Marion Cotillard, and the victims were also very beautiful like Matt Damon, Gwyneth Paltrow. They're very sympathetic characters. The conspiracy blogger, played by Jude Law, who actually is normally very attractive. I think he's a very, very handsome man. But for the film... They went out of their way to make him very unattractive. They presented him as, like, slimy and scheming, and they even, like, used prosthetic teeth to make it look like he had really kind of gnarly teeth, just to kind of increase his unattractive factor to... it. it, it it's just so silly, like... You know, he's the evil, ugly villain. Um, it was it was just really a strange thing, but it was just so obvious to me as I was watching the movie. So, But it seems like this movie foreshadows a possible future wherein we have to be on guard against those who would try to convince us that the government has anything less than noble intentions. And 
really, I was kind of shocked that by the end, there wasn't a message that said brought to you by the Centers for Disease Control and the friendly politicians that love you ever so much. By the way, can you hear Solomon crying? He really, <laughs> he's in a mood right now. You're all right, Solomon. Okay. So anyway, all of that said, and the spoilers galore, but I want to tell you that you should see the film, not because it really is anything of, you know, value so much as it's just like this lesson in the high art of manipulation through entertainment. It really, really is. So go out and see that movie, but that movie just kind of, I'm sure it's probably on Netflix or something by now because it's years ago that it came out, but uh, it really, I was thinking about this because of what we talked about with John Rappaport, because of what we're seeing with this Zika virus, because of the things that he exposes about the CDC. Most of you out there probably already know that the CDC is a little questionable at best. You know, you, you've seen probably their weird, like zombie apocalypse, um, marketing stuff. It's like super creepy. Um, we know that they work hand in hand with big pharma, but the way that John Rappaport is going to tell you some of the inner workings of it and like exposing some of their new rules that have just recently been passed. I'm talking about like in the past several months, things that will make your hair stand on end that are a matter of like law now. They're, they're a matter of public record and they're a matter, it could affect each and every single one of us at any given time. And it's something to be very, very, very aware of. So this is an episode that you're going to want to share with your buddies. Take the link, put it on your Facebook, shoot it out through Twitter, email it to your friends, whatever you want to do. But this is important stuff, you guys. And I think you are really going to benefit from the information that my guest, John Rappaport, is sharing with us in this episode. Remember, if you want to learn more about John Rappaport, you can go to his website, nomorefakenews.com. And, you know, he approaches this from a secular point of view. So the information that he shares with regard to government corruption, with regard to uh, epidemic dise uh, diseases, with regard to um, natural health, all of this stuff, it's points that we can all converge on and we can all uh, agree upon. So without any further ado, let's get into it. Zika virus with John Rappaport of NoMoreFakeNews.com. That's NoMoreFakeNews.com. that every year or so a new infectious virus or disease emerges into our consciousness via media coverage, government warnings, and in recent years we've gone from SARS to swine flu, Ebola. Each, we are told, is a crisis level outbreak, potentially planting pandemic fear into our collective minds, conditioned through the entertainment industry to expect men in biohazard suits to carry us from our homes into a quarantine zone, and we're helpless observers as we watch everyone around us succumb to the virus. The latest scare being presented to us is that of the Zika virus, a mosquito-borne virus that is particularly sinister because it's purported to have this devastating effect on pregnant women, causing them to give birth to children with horrible disabilities and deformities. Surely we must do something, everything in our power, to rid the planet of such an evil contagion, right? The Centers for T Disease Control would always be honest with us, right? And they always have our best interests at heart, do they not? So for this episode, I've invited John Rappaport to discuss the truth behind the Zika virus and why our government benefits from keeping us in this state of constant fear. John Rappaport has been an investigative journalist for over 30 years, written articles on politics, health, media, culture, and art for LA Weekly, Spin Magazine, Village Voice, CBS, and more. He has made appearances on major media platforms such as ABC's Nightline, Coast to Coast AM with George Norrie. He's been an outspoken ad activist against corporate chemical companies such as Monsanto. He has lectured all over the U.S. concerning issues ranging from alternative health to 
government corruption. It is an honor and a privilege to have John Rappaport here today on Beyond Extraordinary Radio to help us kind of parse through the truth behind what the powers that be want us to believe and what they want us to be afraid of. John, thank you so much for joining us today and helping us figure all of this out. Thank you. Good to be here. It's, you know, I've noticed that this all summer long, we have been bombarded with media coverage of the Zika virus and how dangerous and fast spreading it is. As we've moved into the fall, obviously the political scene has kind of pushed it a little bit to the side, but it's not gone away. I did a quick Google search just this morning in the past 24 hours. New York Times is reporting that the first baby in Puerto Rico was born with uh, Zika-related microcephaly. Um, USA Today is saying the Zika virus is not controllable, according to the CDC director. So, you know, let's just jump in by saying, what is the Zika virus? What is it? Zika virus was discovered for the first time 1947-48. In the interim, it's never been known to cause anything serious, just a mild transient illness for a few days, no treatment very few symptoms, uh, the person recovers well, no problem. Then all of a sudden, uh, roughly a year ago or so in Brazil, we had this hysteria build up over birth defects called microcephaly, baby born with smaller head, neurological damage, and immediately this was blamed on the Zika virus. Well. I've been tracking these so-called epidemics for nigh on to 20, 25 years now. I see a familiar pattern in all of them. Unfortunately, the public is never educated on the question of how do you prove that a particular virus causes a particular condition? That is the key question. That is a scientific question. That is not some question for scare headlines and talking heads on television shows and uh, high IQ idiots pronouncing all kinds of dire consequences. It's a very basic, thorny scientific question. And the first step and I want to emphasize that because this is not the whole thing. The first step in the process of proving that a particular virus causes a particular condition is that you line up many, many cases of this condition or illness, whatever it is. You make sure that all of the people or babies in this case do in fact have that condition and not something else. And then you discover how many of those babies actually have the presence of the Zika virus in their body. That's the first step. If you can't prove an overwhelming correlation, 80%, 90%, 100% between the presence of the virus and the condition or the illness, you go back to the drawing board. In this case, as usual, that was never done because the correlation was always extremely weak. In Brazil, in Colombia, for example, many cases of people who were found with Zika virus and practically zero cases of the birth defect. Studies that were done by the CDC and other organizations attempting to prove this correlation all failed miserably, although they were promoted to have succeeded because there is a political and economic agenda here. So what listeners have to understand is that the scientific program to prove that Zika had any connection with birth defects has been a total failure, complete and utter failure. There is no evidence for any connection, much less causative connection. And I know that many people will find this hard to believe because they are programmed to accept whatever these 
uh, big health agencies state, like the CDC, the World Health Organization. Those organizations have been dead wrong before when it comes to these fake epidemics, and they are wrong again. So that's the background against which uh, we can talk about whatever we need to talk about. But people have to understand that is at the root of this fake science, fake research, fake pronouncements, fake media stories, and a sold out medical press, by which I mean workaday medical reporters who work for the mainstream, who simply take press releases uh, from major health uh, agencies and governments and parrot them. Yes, and you know, I, as I've been watching this unfold, obviously it, it does kind of feel like history repeats itself. It's always something being pushed to the forefront of our minds. With Zika, it seems to me particularly sinister, especially being a woman of a certain age, you know, it, it really caught my attention because there it seems to be the main concern is what it does to pregnant women and babies. Now, if there's no evidence that it's connected directly to the virus, and we're spraying this stuff all over the place, trying to get rid of all of the mosquitoes, what, in your opinion, is causing these birth defects? Um, you know, I think maybe those of us with maybe more of a, a outside the box thinking could, could make the connection, but let, let's talk about that. Okay. <clears throat> well, first of all, you've got pesticides being sprayed all over Brazil. Uh, and including the northeast sector where these cases of birth defects supposedly spiked. And these pesticides are toxic, and they can cause birth defects of all kinds. That has been established. Brazil is a country, the number one country, in the use of pesticides in the world, these toxic chemicals. So we would start there. We would go to a so-called larvicide, which is a pesticide that supposedly kills uh, mosquitoes that carry the Zika virus, being intentionally placed in water supplies in Brazil, unannounced to the public. A group of Brazilian doctors came forth and made this announcement probably eight months ago, and when you put this in the water supplies, of course, you are now talking about gross exposure to this chemical, and people don't even know it. Then you have in Florida, for example, as an after effect of all of this fake science, the spraying to kill mosquitoes with a compound called NALED, N-A-L-E-D, which is an organophosphate pesticide. All organophosphate pesticides are extremely toxic, and the literature indicates that, indeed, they can cause birth defects. In addition to that, you have the Tdap vaccine, tetanus diphtheria, uh, pertussis, that was unleashed on pregnant women in Brazil in 2014, recommended for all pregnant women in Brazil suddenly out of the blue. Well, this vaccine contains aluminum, which passes through the what's called the blood-brain barrier. And as everybody knows, aluminum is a neurotoxin. So suddenly we have that popping up, which is certainly an area for further investigation because it's been targeted to pregnant women in Brazil. So those are a few of the actual agents that could very well cause microcephaly or this birth defect. In addition to that, if you look up the medical literature in the United States, you will see a huge variation in statistics of microcephaly cases in America long before anybody was talking about the Zika virus. Anywhere from 1,500 
to 25,000 cases a year cited in medical literature relevant to the United States from all sorts of causes that are well known, for example, gross and severe malnutrition in the mother, toxic chemicals in the environment. This has long been understood. If you wreak havoc on the immune system, the neurotransmitter system, the neurological functioning of a pregnant woman, you are going to get all kinds of horrendous effects, potentially in the babies that they give birth to. And let me just add one extra thing here. This story has not been followed up on, but I covered it extensively almost immediately with the hysteria around Zika. In Central and South America, where some countries severely limit abortions or restrict them entirely, agencies, companies have developed that take pregnant women out to sea beyond the three mile limit, in other words, beyond national government's control into international waters and perform abortions on them to because of the fear of the Zika virus. And women have gone on these trips and have had pregnant women and have had their babies aborted and come back. This is a horrific consequence of the fake science that underlies this whole thing. When we're talking about women feeling so desperate about the potential effects that they've been told are connected to this virus, feeling so desperate that they have to take these extreme measures such as abortion, it brings to my mind thoughts about uh, eugenics and, uh, you know, population control, things like this. What is the reason why it would be in the government's interest to make us believe that this virus is what is causing these horrible birth defects? What, what's, their, what's their end game? Women who are not yet pregnant, never mind women who are, will think twice, three times, four times about getting pregnant. That's de facto population control. Mm -hmm. And we're not merely talking about Brazil. We're talking about all over the world because stories keep appearing in the press about Zika has shown up here, Zika has shown up there. Let's be clear about that. As I said at the top, Zika was discovered in 1947-48. That doesn't mean that it came into being in 1947. Right. It could have been on the planet for 100,000 to 200,000 years, or who knows how long. Viruses travel. They go all over the place. You could find Zika, if you looked for it, everywhere in this world. It's not spreading. It's already there. That's the trick that is being performed, the stage magic trick to scare women. Oh, it's spreading. We just found some Puerto Rico, and then we found it here in Miami, and then we found it in Colombia, and we found it in uh, Germany, and here and there. And there. Oh, my God, it's spreading. No, it's already there. It's been there forever, and it causes virtually nothing. So population control, no doubt. Yeah. This is the first fake epidemic in modern history where the targeting of the misinformation and disinformation is specifically pregnant women. Now we know from documents such as a famous Henry Kissinger 1970s memorandum, research that's been ongoing <clears throat> for decades and decades at the Rockefeller Institute and other research facilities into vaccines, for example, that will knock out fertility in women. It's an overt form of population control. Many such vaccines and other means have been researched at these laboratories for a very long time with the goal of reducing world population. 
and we had the case in Kenya for example in the last several years where Catholic bishops announced that a hormone that causes miscarriage in women HCG had been inserted into vaccines given to women in Kenya and that caused a tremendous scandal and an ongoing debate and argument between the government and the Catholic bishops about which labs uh, were approved to test these vials of vaccines. One set of labs that the bishops used said indeed this hormone is present in the vaccines given to pregnant women or given to women in Kenya. The other set of labs used by the government purportedly said they found no trace of this uh, hormone. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, unresolved as far as uh, the official press in Kenya is concerned. But I frankly see no reason why Catholic bishops in Kenya would make this pronouncement if they had not found this to be true. So there's another example of population control underway. This is very real. It's an agenda of globalism, to put a generality on it, to reduce population. Well, here with Zika, the fear itself produces depopulation. Women will say, I don't want to get pregnant. Women have been warned. If you travel to these areas, don't get pregnant for six months, a year, two years, three years. Don't travel to these areas. Hysteria has built up to the point where uh, I'm sure that figures and statistics will reflect in certain areas a lowered birth rate in the next few years to come. Yeah, you know, just as a personal anecdote, when I first started hearing about the Zika virus, um, you know, I, I was I had noticed first of all I had noticed I live in North Dakota usually there's a lot of mosquitoes especially as the summer progresses I had noticed there wasn't a lot of mosquitoes not nearly as many as there usually are but there was one day when I was going for a walk and I just kind of got swarmed and despite all of the information in my head and despite the fact that I consider myself to be an awake individual I was overcome with fear that I was getting bitten by all of these mosquitoes. It was all of this programming and all of this propaganda just consumed me with fear. Now, if someone like myself who has this sort of worldview, this sort of understanding that things aren't always what they seem, if I was able to be filled with fear, I can only imagine what the average woman who just takes everything that she's told to heart and as truth I can I can see women making decisions about postponing having children or even coming to worse decisions about terminating existing pregnancies God forbid you know now let, let's talk about the other side of it which is vaccines surely vaccines come into play here too not just sort of preventing people from having children but after they have the children inoculations that have all kinds of other sinister side effects to them that's got to be part of the agenda as well yes it usually is with these fake epidemics not always is there a vaccine that is developed but sometimes there is for example the swine flu vaccine which injured many people uh, and that was on the basis of an entirely fake epidemic mm -hmm. uh, which maybe we have time here I'll tell yes. you a little story about that but <clears throat> um, absolutely I mean just use common sense a baby does not have a formed immune system it gets its immune protection initially from the mother from the mother's immune system. That's why breastfeeding is so important, for example. But if you are now going to inject babies with vaccines, and that is the program, 
hepatitis B vaccine on the first day of birth, for example, it makes no sense whatsoever because in order to even accept the orthodox story about why vaccines work, even if you, you know, were committed to that orthodox account, yes. you would have to assume that the recipient of the vaccines had an intact and functioning immune system of their own. Otherwise, the whole thing would be just absurd. Well, babies don't have that. So now you are injecting germs into a baby, toxic chemicals like formaldehyde, like uh, aluminum, a whole host of chemicals that people can look up when, you know, vaccine ingredients and see what's in them. This is, uh, you know, Russian roulette. This is playing with fire. But of course, most people don't want to hear this. They don't want to think about it because then they're going to be faced with making an independent choice. But to get back to the case of the swine flu, for example, yeah. here was a, a, quote, epidemic that was promoted to the hilt in 2009. Oh, there's going to be millions of deaths and fear, fear, hysteria. And then behind that, of course, get the vaccine. In other words, the CDC, the World Health Organization, uh, and other such agencies were heavily promoting, as they always do, vaccines. In this case, for you know the big killer. Okay, so in the early fall of 2009, a CBS investigative reporter, one of their only investigative reporters, Cheryl Atkinson, discovered a couple of mind-boggling facts. In the United States, where the CDC was claiming that there were maybe 10,000 or so cases of swine flu already, the CDC had actually stopped counting swine flu cases, and they didn't tell anybody that they had stopped counting. I mean, this is their mandate. That's what they do. They make reports every week on numbers of cases, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and they had just stone cold stopped. And nobody knew. And she investigated it and discovered the real reason why. The overwhelming number of blood samples taken from the most likely swine flu cases in America and sent to labs, and we're talking about many, many, many blood samples, overwhelmingly came back with no trace of swine flu or any other kind of flu. In other words, the whole thing was a hoax. I mean, from the ground up. And she published a piece about this on the CBS News website. Now, I've interviewed her about this. I know her. So, what happened? Her editor told her that this was the most original story about the swine flu epidemic that he had ever seen and it was fantastic and terrific and they were going to try to get it on the nightly national CBS newscast which people have to understand would give you way more exposure than an article on the CBS news website now we're talking about the big time here to make this kind of announcement of what I've just said on the CBS evening news that would go all around the world and all of a sudden, there was no support for it at CBS. The whole thing was just dropped like a stone in a lake. And no matter what Cheryl did, no matter what her editor did, whatever, it was completely cut off as if the story had never been published. Now, this is bad enough. I mean, this you're talking about a scandal, right? right, which no other mainstream news outlet in America covered by the way. At the time that I exposed all this through Cheryl, I might have been the only reporter that actually followed up on this. Maybe there were a few others. I don't know. But several weeks after Cheryl's story was published on the CBS News website, 
the CDC, obviously, <clears throat> in a complete panic, decided that they would double down on the big lie about the number of swine flu cases in America. And in an article that I wrote, citing WebMD, which quoted the CDC, they now estimated, get this, that there were in fact about 22 million cases of swine flu in America. Not mm. 22,000, 22 million cases of swine flu in America, which follows the propaganda formula when you're caught in a lie, tell a much bigger lie. Yes. That's what they did. And nobody that I know of at the time, except me, gave voice to that incredible you know, yeah. lie. In fact, I'm sure there are people listening to this show right now who not only can't believe what I'm saying, but it doesn't even register because it's so outrageous. It is outrageous, and it brings to mind to me, uh, I had recently heard, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I had recently heard that the CDC is, has issued these new rules involving quarantines and, you know, um, inoculation without consent. Am I right about this? Is there something? Yeah. What, yep. what is this about? Okay. <clears throat> Let's call it uh, two months ago, three months ago now. The CDC, Centers for Disease Control, announced <clears throat> on their website <clears throat> and in the Federal Register that they were formulating a new set of regulations about communicable diseases in America and that there would be a public comment period that would end on October 14th. So we're past that now. A little bit of background. What does that mean? Regulations. All federal agencies issue these regulations, which they claim are in line with laws that have already been passed by Congress. Could be a recent law, could be a law of 20 years ago, it doesn't matter. This is an outrageous trick of government because, in fact, what these agencies routinely do is they twist the meaning of a law passed by Congress to formulate dozens, hundreds, who knows, thousands of pages of regulations that they claim are in line with the law but are actually not. In other words, they are making law, which they are forbidden to do, under the cover of simply uh, fleshing out the law that's already been passed by Congress, and this is the case here. So what they're basically saying is Anyone traveling in the U.S. between states or coming back home into the U.S. suspected of carrying a communicable disease that could, quote, impact human health could be stopped and detained and examined. And if the verdict is, and no, you can't walk away from this and you can't get a lawyer. And if the verdict is that you have such an illness, or could have, you can then be quarantined. And during the quarantine period, you can be treated medically, forcibly, without recourse. That would include toxic medical drugs, uh, forced vaccinations, all sorts of any kind of medical treatment at all. And then upon release, you could be and would be electronically tracked. And that would go all the way up to wearing an electronic ankle bracelet. Now, if that doesn't sound bad enough, if that doesn't sound like a medical police state, the CDC has invented a new category in these regulations which is right out of Orwell in 1984, so don't expect to be able to understand it, <laughs> called pre-communicable disease. Now, what the hell does that mean? That is that incredibly means that Orwellian sounding. If you might have come in contact with a person in the past 
who could have a communicable disease that could impact on human health even if the symptoms you have are mild or even if there are no symptoms you could be labeled pre communicable and therefore fall under this whole Orwellian program of detainment quarantine forced medical treatment surveillance I mean with a straight face you can see in these regulations that the CDC has put forward this just boggling gibberish definition of pre-communicable in other words anybody yeah anybody in the US could be tagged detained quarantined this is a new uh, escalation of a long time medical program that seeks to have absolute medical control which means political control control of freedom over any citizen any resident any person in the US that's what is coming up it's terrifying because you know people who are students of history people who are students of literature people who think outside the box you know we can familiarize ourselves with this concept of Orwellian pre-crime and that sounds dastardly and it sounds like the ultimate of a future big brother police state but I don't think many of us or any of us could have ever anticipated there would be such a thing as pre illness or pre contagion that you're right it, it it could be any of us that's right it could be any of us and I've been warning for years now in my writing and speaking about medical covert operations all over the world and I've detailed them and what I've said is look medical covert ops are by far the most successful because they appear to have no partisan influence or agenda because <laughs> we've been propagandized to believe for over a century now that doctors and medical organizations are only looking out for our well-being we are politically neutral we are just trying to restore health to people we are the good guys etc 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 and I've warned and said this is why the medical cartel is so dangerous because most people refuse to believe that behind the phalanx of doctors most of whom have been indoctrinated to believe that what they're doing is good they just really have no awareness about what they're doing and the harm they're causing behind all that is a very sinister program to put everyone on the planet inside a cradle or womb to grave system of toxic control that will gradually debilitate them all the way onto the cemetery and also cover up what is actually killing people and debilitating populations because you see as we discussed in the case of Zika and we didn't take it all the way if you propagandize a basically harmless virus as the cause of a dire condition now that virus is acting as a cover story to obscure the real causes of whatever the condition is and it also the virus as a cover story protects the people the corporations the elites who are doing the damage the real damage on purpose through other means not a virus I've written time and time again the virus is the greatest cover story on planet earth because people buy it they're afraid of it the tiny invisible terrorist that we can't even see and we don't even know when it's there and my god and uh, 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 all of that and try to boil it down in just a few minutes but for example in Africa for 
much longer than a century, the basic factors that debilitate, destroy, and kill people in certain uh, dire places are severe malnutrition, generation to generation hunger, starvation, protein calorie malnutrition, lack of basic sanitation, contaminated water supplies, grinding poverty, no work, stolen farmland by major corporations, toxic medical treatments of people whose immune systems are already on the edge. These are some of the ongoing endemic continuing factors that really kill people. When you have people in this dire condition, generation to generation, any germ that comes down the pipeline, which would otherwise cause absolutely no harm to a healthy population, will kill them. It's no magic to understand that. No, the immune system routinely wards off all manner of germs. If you have no immune system, then any germ can kill you. So these conditions have been perpetuated and maintained on purpose by local tyrants and dictators in these countries who are making deals with outside financiers, multinational corporations, etc., etc., to allow the selling off of their entire countries. The incredibly fertile farmland in many cases, the slave or cheap labor, the mineral rights, the water rights, the mining rights, etc., 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 require that you have a debilitated population that can't really see or deal with what's going on. These conditions are what's killing people. But you see, then the medical propaganda is completely the opposite. Oh, no, 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 it's HIV. No, 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 it's Ebola. No, 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 it's this virus, it's that virus, it's just the virus, it's that, ba, 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 And we're sending drugs in a humanitarian program to treat these people and look, here's an airplane landing in Uganda and men in white coats are getting off and isn't it wonderful that uh, you know we have given aid to these people blah 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 that's all the cover story these doctors are not going to do any good they're going to do harm they're going to give toxic drugs and vaccines to people that have no immune systems and in the process they are going to produce a cover story that will keep people from understanding that the very basic conditions that cause people from generation to generation to get sick and die are being purposefully maintained. I mean, there's probably 10,000 companies in the world right now that could go into any African nation and clean up the water supply in six months. <laughs> well, yeah. But it doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. Instead, the World Health Organization releases task force reports. Yes, we have to clean up the water, blah, 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 blah. How about returning stolen farmland to the people so they can grow good food for themselves? How about, you know, just the simple things of life? They are all being buried by governments and media under this cover story of the virus, the virus, the virus, and, and we are the humane ones who are sending the doctors in to treat the virus. This is utter nonsense. You know, John, just to wrap up, I am thinking as I'm listening to you discuss all of these things, and it's, it's horrifying, it's discouraging, it's upsetting. I'm thinking about the main sort of delivery of this propaganda to us is through the mainstream media. Um, we wouldn't have any idea of, as a population about Zika if it wasn't for this being reported to us through various news agencies. Someone such as yourself who has worked inside mainstream media and on the periphery of it, I'm so it, it moves me emotionally that there are people like out like you out there who are covering these stories and making this information known to us that we can kind of see the 
the the light through the cracks in 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 the mainstream media and the narrative that they are delivering on behalf of those who are pulling their strings and controlling them. It used to be that a journalist had integrity. It used to be that a reporter's job was to report for the people and not answer to corporations. This isn't the case anymore. I'm thrilled that there are people like you out there doing what you're doing. It means a lot to me and it means a lot to all of us. So I'm so grateful to you for coming on the show and for continuing to do what you are doing and I hope we can have you on again sometime to talk maybe in more generalities about government and control and all the things that you've devoted a lifetime to uncovering with your work. Thank you so much. I'd be happy to do that. 